But then much more specifically, there are certain things that if you can't produce at home, you can get in trouble down the line. It works as long as globalization is working, as long as free trade is working. You know, so for instance, uh, steel is a classic case where a lot of other countries figured out how to make steel more cheaply than the United States and we outsourced tons of steel production. But that can become a very serious national security issue. It gets more specific, if you want to talk about computer parts, things in the supply chain of sophisticated defense equipment like fighter jets and tanks. Fighter jet right. parts. You really don't want to have those outsourced to other countries, especially countries that you might someday be in a conflict with who could just refuse to sell them. Michael Anton, so great to have you back on American Thought Leaders. Thank you. We're doing the fist pump, coronavirus, can never be too, uh, too careful. So I actually said to someone at an event last night who shook my hand, this may be the last handshake of 2020 for all I know. And they didn't get it at first, but then they, they figured it out. Yeah, no, and it's frankly really good, good policy to, you know, at this time, it's better to be safe. Yeah. So I, you know, I heard from you a little while ago that you're working on a book. I am. And I wanted to sort of dig into that. I know it's going to be a little while before it comes out, but yeah. I know everything that you're thinking about is something I, I'm interested in. I also have to finish so, writing it, which is yeah. a complicated I see. So factor. thank you for taking the time, yeah. I know. Um, so tell me, what is, what, 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 what's on your mind? Well, the, the book is about, in a way it's an election book, but it's also bigger than an election book. So I definitely will make the case for President Trump's re-election, but I also want to describe to people the depth of what I consider to be the, the crisis, if you want to be frank, of American politics, which Trump has partially solved. He certainly addressed it, but he needs another four years, and I think even if he gets another four years, it's going to take longer than that to dig the country out of the hole that we're in. I'd like to see, and I will make the case for, a much more explicitly Trumpist Republican Party going forward, a much more explicitly nationalist, populist, uh, economically, uh, you know, protectionist, if you will, um, you know, a, a party that um, is more openly supportive of bringing manufacturing home, of insourcing, of rebuilding our industrial base, all of these kinds of things that the Republican Party hasn't been staunchly in favor of or has been indifferent to or ambivalent about for a long time. I think we're going to need all of that for a generation. You know, one eight-year presidency will, in hindsight is my hope, will look to be the turning point, but we're not going to accomplish everything in those eight years. And that's not to take anything away from the president. I don't think any, any president could accomplish everything we need to accomplish in eight years, but we have to get started. He's gotten us off to a great start and we got to keep going. We got to keep going through a second term and then beyond that second term. So, well, for start, I have so many questions, but for starters, what is the crisis that you're seeing that this is an answer to? I think it's the, it's the crisis that led to the stunning 2016 victory that all of our elites, none, none of them predicted, they all failed to predict, that the political science profession, which itself is supposed to understand elections, failed to predict it the same way the economics profession failed to predict the 2008 financial crisis. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crisis of legitimacy. Uh, it's also a crisis where a good half of the country feels at best left out and at worst almost held in contempt by their elites, ignored, um, mocked, right? And, and it's, it's, it's a crisis that, I, as I said, President Trump has gone far to addressing. And there are many metrics by which you can judge that. Basic metrics such as employment numbers, right track, wrong track numbers, all of these things look better now than they did on the day of the 2016 election. Um, there's also a sense, I think, from Red State America or Rust Belt America or Heartland America that they're being heard now and they hadn't been in a long time. But none of them believe that all of their problems have been solved. I mean, um, you know, the opioid crisis ha hasn't been solved. It, it's been addressed, made progress, hasn't been solved. Um, unemployment is much better than it has been, but wage stagnation, there's so many things. Deindustrialization, you know, you can't take I think anybody should know this, but you can't take generations of people who have been working certain types of jobs and certain types of industries and then just tell them cavalierly, learn to code, become programmers and app designers, and all of a sudden your rural and heartland and Rust Belt communities will turn around. Uh, so that's been a crisis. Uh, you know, I, 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 follow, I watch the Tucker Carlson show pretty frequently. I'm a big fan. And, and he said, look, over the past 30 years, this has been a massive failure of elites. Um, to see what was going on in the country and to govern the country intelligently in a way that's best for all its citizens. And finally people they got fed up and they gave the system a shock and the system needed a shock. Um, and that shock has 
as, as I say, it's been helpful, but it's going to take a long time to dig us out of this. You know, uh, you're talking about you know bringing manufacturing back. Yeah. Right. Um, it's interesting. One of we I just did an interview recently talking a little bit about how coronavirus is kind of, I guess, you know, displaying this issue why it's important yeah. to. Well, there's really if you if you say there's two fundamental reasons why it's important. Uh, one is that. Uh, it's simply that the, you know more industries here, the more domestic production we have, the more jobs we can create, the more healthy communities we can create. So that's just purely as an economic matter, and a, so and a social matter. It's not even purely an economic. It's both an economic and a social matter. But then much more specifically, there are certain things that if you can't produce at home, you can get in trouble down the line. It works as long as globalization is working, as long as free trade is working. You know, so for instance, uh, steel is a classic case where. A lot of other countries figured out how to make steel more cheaply than the United States, and we outsourced tons of steel production. But that can become a very serious national security issue. It gets more specific. If you want to talk about computer parts, things in the supply chain right. of sophisticated defense equipment like fighter jets and tanks. Yeah, fighter jet right. parts. You really don't want to have those outsourced yeah. to other countries, especially countries that you might someday be in a conflict with who could just refuse to sell them. And now it's, look, it's Peter Navarro, White House trade advisor, yes. has been very out front talking about this lately. I've been really uh, been encouraged by what he's had to say. He says, look, it doesn't make sense for us to lose the ability to produce certain medicines, to produce surgical masks or these kinds of things. Uh, we need those here. And I, I did hear him say the other day, he said, look, in crises like these, we have no allies. Even our closest allies in the past, Australia, Britain, etc., have said during the swine flu outbreak, we're just not going to we're not going to sell you these things that you need because we need them now. Right. And it's hard to blame them. We would probably do the same thing in that circumstance, except we can't because we don't have the ability to produce these things or we've lost most of the ability. So uh, we need more insourcing and more domestic production for, I think, all three reasons, for economic reasons, for health of the community, and for national security reasons. You know, and to your point, from what I understand it, you know, essentially all the production of these masks surgical masks and also PPEs, these suits yeah. that people are you see wearing in these coronavirus areas, they're produced in China. Right. It's it's a it's a pure kind of economic theory play on the on the theory of which is not an invalid theory of comparative advantage. If country X can build a certain product at a lower marginal cost than country Y, then country Y should focus on what it's good at that what other countries can't do any better than right. it. Everything will even out in a globalized supply chain. Except for the fact that moving goods around the world is not simply a matter of economics. It's often a matter of health security. It's often a matter of, of physical security. It's often a matter of simply of national politics. Not, you know, economics is always only a factor. It, it's, it's, sometimes it's the preeminent factor if everything's going well, but it be, ceases to be the preeminent factor when everything else is not going well, and it's never the only factor. What, what do you expect uh, is going to happen uh, I guess in the next uh, few months with this yeah. supply chain questions and, and manufacturing and Well, so I'm forth. already yeah. hearing or seeing news that uh, companies that, you know, that aren't, let's say, making or relying on products specifically in this medical space, but their supply chains are disrupted because travel restrictions and things like that are saying, I can't go even four or six months without these certain products. I've got to find alternatives. And the second point is that they're thinking to themselves, wow, actually maybe the last 20 years of outsourcing, I got lucky because nothing like this happened. But now having it happen once, it's made me mindful of the fact that anything that's happened once could happen again. Right. And since I don't know the severity and I don't know how long it will last, I don't know how long I'm going to have to wait. And so just as a practical matter going forward, I'm going to have to look at alternatives to putting all my eggs in one or two overseas baskets. Um, that makes sense to me. I mean, if I were running one of these companies, that's certainly what I'd be looking at now. And it's, so it's, it's both a matter of outsourcing and deindustrialization of the United States, which is a problem in and of itself, but it's also lack of diversification, right? Mm -hmm. In that, uh, you know, there, the United States has supply chains and companies get goods from all over the world, but predominantly since China's accession to the WTO, so much has concentrated in one country, mm -hmm. partly because of its size and the sheer size of its labor market, and, and its own massive industrial base with all of these cities that, you know, it, it, when China slows down or closes up, um, 
you have a problem because so many of those eggs were put into that one basket. Right. I mean, and also with part of a very deliberate strategy to create these dependencies. Well, right, on, the, think, on the part yeah. of China. I mean, yeah, China yeah. definitely sold itself to U.S. companies as we can be the one stop for you on all kinds of things. Because we have this giant labor market, um, because we have an industrial base, because we have, you know, think of how many, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but if you look at it, the number of industrialized cities in China or regions with higher than 10 million population simply dwarfs that of any other country because of China's sheer size. So they'll come to you and say, we have all of these great advantages. Um, we're big, we're connected, we're wired into the financial system. You can come here, you don't have to deal with going, you know, three, four, five different regulatory environments. There's only one regulatory environment that you have to deal with. American multinational banks are already here doing JVs with Chinese banks and stuff. We're, they're going to try to make this as one-stop convenient for you as possible. And if you're a corporate leader, you know, I don't mean to be too critical of them, but I'm going to be a little critical of them. If you're a corporate leader thinking short-term, mm -hmm. thinking about quarterly profits, thinking about expenses, then you think well, the more convenient you can make this for me, the easier, you know, the less, uh, the more frictionless, the better. Right. But it does, but when you take the longer view. When you take the longer view, anytime uh, a bump, you hit a bump, you don't really, you know, you don't, and you don't have an alternative plan, life can be, right. your life can get complicated. So this is, I mean, essentially coronavirus is this kind of sort of bump that for, for many, many, many. It's a bump. Uh, now we'll, we'll see. I do think there's uh, plenty of participants in the market who would still, now look, as a, as a global health matter, we'd all like to see this go away as soon as possible. There's no question about it. We'd like to see, um, you know, a cure found quickly, uh, um, incredibly reliable tests devised very quickly, right. maybe a vaccine, something that reduces the severity and even kills the thing off. I mean, we've seen in the last 20 years a few similar kind of outbreaks that people worried could become a global pandemic that thankfully did not become global pandemics. SARS, uh, a MERS, I think was one of them, yeah, the swine flu. So everyone is hoping that this will be like that. Although right now it looks like it's already more severe, and so definitely. But then, does. certainly we're hoping that it doesn't get significantly worse and grow into something huge as a global health matter. There's probably also, perfectly understandably, on the part of certain people in the corporate world and the global business world who are hoping for that, just so that it doesn't disrupt their supply chains and interfere with their operations too much. I'm not saying that that's the only reason yeah. they care. I'm sure yeah. they care for health reasons yeah. too. It's the question though is whether that second reason will cause companies to hold back and say, I don't have to make any radical changes yet. I want to wait further and see how this plays out, and I'm hoping it goes away. Okay. Whereas, you know, I think that uh, what, what Peter Navarro and others are arguing for is an abundance of caution. You know, start making alternative plans now. How, how quickly, I mean, this is more like a you know, specific trade question, but when all manufacturing of something, let's say, like masks or or, yeah. or or PPEs is gone, you know, we just don't we don't have the the knowledge on hand. How quickly can you build and build an industry I actually, like this? You don't, I don't know the yeah. answer. I mean, you need yeah. a real industrial yeah, we, economist yeah. for that. All I, I will say that is though, these things are. People always say, you know, oh, oh, we can just innovate that, no problem, right? Well, or, yeah. the reason yeah. why I'm hopeful is. There was a time not long ago when these things didn't exist. Somebody had to invent it and figure out a way to build it. If you lose the capacity to do it and you can't buy it anywhere else, I'm completely confident that the United States can figure out a way to build them again. It, right. I don't know how long it will take before somebody, you know. And, it, and, and also what happens over time is, okay, let's say we absolutely can't import, we have no capacity to make them and we can't import them because no one will sell them to us. Uh, probably in the beginning, the uh, um, production that is the marginal cost of each mask is gonna be very, very high compared to what, so if you were used to paying whatever, five cents a mask from China, but we rebuild factories to build them here, and you're paying a buck a mask at first because of the in, uh, initial yes. capital cost, and there's no efficiency of scale. Well, that's the kind of thing that comparative advantage in economic theory would say is outrageous. If, if you can get it for five cents over here, how can you possibly pay a buck over here? The answer is because we can't get it for five cents over here anymore, but over time that, that upfront cost will, will go down. And hopefully, we will have learned our lesson and say, you know what? Um, that's not to say we'll never import another mask, but we're never, we maybe never should do what we did before, which is 
uh, outsource or um, import to the extent that we kill and just zero out all domestic production and then we have to start from zero again. We'll find a balance. So, you know, you've of course been making the case for populism. This is this is one of your topics. Yeah. Um, always very, very interesting. How, how do you lay that out? Um, how is it looking right now, like, based on your? Uh, well, because the, there's because there's all these forces at play, right? I mean, R I'd be very liberal. bullish on populism yeah. right now, given that. The president is unopposed uh, and, and is in a strong position to be reelected, and that the, the likely Democratic nominee is a populist. Now, it, they're populism of very different stripes, and I certainly um, don't want to see Bernie Sanders president of the United States, and I don't want to see Bernie Sanders' brand of populism enacted as policy. But a lot of the anger that's driving Bernie Sanders' support, I think, arises from pretty much the same place that drove a lot of President Trump's support. People feeling ignored, feeling that the system is rigged, and not just rigged, but rigged against them. Um, and so, you know, if I could persuade the Bernie bros, I know that I can't, they'll never listen to me, I would say, you're right to be angry. You're even right about many of the causes of your anger, but your solutions, not only are they not going to work, they're going to make everything worse. And Trump wants for you much of what you want. So. You know, come come along over to our side. Now they're not they're not listening to me. They're probably yelling at me right now uh, for saying that, and saying that I'm a liar and a ruling class shill or whatever. But the, the fact of the matter is, um, all of the great productivity gains, the stock market gains, the innovation gains, the tech gains, all these wonderful things that have happened in this country in the last 30 or 40 years have been shared more and equally than really at any time since the robber baron era, if I can use that derisive term. Okay. And maybe more unequally than since the robber baron era. I've, I've dug into the statistics on this for the book, trying to see if I could prove conclusively okay. that the Gini coefficient is higher now than it was then, and I can't. All I can say is that it's gone up steadily um, since the uh, sort of the mid 20th century economic boom, which was widely shared, ended. Um, you know, from that point on, yes. you've just seen economic inequality rise and rise and rise. And it's only now started to go down. Uh, since President Trump tightened the labor market, reduced unemployment, you've seen wage hikes, you know, real, real wage rises at the bottom and in the middle for the first time in decades. Now, it went up so much that a couple of years of down are, are promising they're not going to solve the problem. That's why I say we need a lot more of this, not just four more years of this. But we certainly need the four more years. So that's very interesting because that's a very different, I guess, lens. I, I, I haven't had, I haven't heard the discussion about the Gini coefficient yeah. change. So you've actually charted this and you've seen I mean, that as it's a non-economist, I've just tried right. to look at what the, the literature that a layman can understand says. Yeah. Okay. With the specific, my specific question was, is it worse now than it was in say, the height of the, uh, you know, what Mark Twain called the Gilded Age, the Industrial Revolution boom when all of the America's first families were building, you know, 100,000 square foot cottages yes. in Newport, Rhode Island, most of which you can go and view in their museums, they still stand yeah. in there. Stunning examples of architecture at its finest, but we're talking an opulence on a scale of a European aristocrat. So we had yeah. massive income inequality in those days, but also, you know, the post-Civil War boom, absent a few panics, which weren't super long lived, was a, essentially a 30 year or longer massive economic expansion that benefited the whole country. Um, what we've increasingly had in this country is, in, is a, is a non-massive but steady economic expansion that hasn't benefited the whole country. And the longer it's gone on, the more the benefits have been very obviously concentrated in the coasts, in the blue metros, and in the, um, you know, the information class, the financial elites and the tech elites and so on. And so, you know, I'm going to be, of course, reading your book sometime in the future about this, but what is the thumbnail of, you know, you, you've already said that some of the policies that are being enacted now are the solution, but that, that's also very, it's very kind of counterintuitive to a lot of what you hear, you know, yeah. being said in the debates, you know, on, on television, that this is, that what, what's happening with these policies isn't just, you know, more lower unemployment, you know, higher uh, uh, stock markets, or, but it's actually more income equality. Yeah, right? income equality, wealth equality, rebuilding communities, you know, I mean, communities in red states in the heartland that have been hollowed out by outsourcing. Now, you know, we can't, we can't be unrealistic and, and say, 
okay, if your mill closed in 2004, we're going to get that same mill back, and we're going back, and we're not going back in time, right? But we can pursue policies that just go in a different direction. We certainly don't need to further hollow out middle America and do further outsourcing. I think we right. need to go in the reverse. So everything is not going to go back to the status quo ante exactly the way it was, but we can start to steer the ship back in a direction where, see, people, I think, more than they want to see an end point, human nature is somewhat rational. It wants to see progress. It wants to feel like things are getting better. So that's why optimism is up right now. If you ask people in, you know, I'm making this up, but like a, a, a mill town a, uh, or a furniture making town in Western North Carolina, um, are things as good now as they were in say 2001? They would say, of course not, right? Are they better than they were in 2015? And they a problem, a lot of them say, yeah. So that's why they feel better. Not because they know they've gotten all the way back to where they started, I see. but because the trend line changed, finally. Instead of down, 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 or just flat, it's up. Even if it's only marginally up, it's up for the first time in a long time. That's what we need to be focused on. So tell me, to finish up, the recipe of policies. You know, this is a quick thumbnail. Yeah. That, that's going to that's gonna help, you know, kind of help reduce that income inequality, create this I mean, boom for everybody. First and foremost, continued immigration um, uh, I was going to say reform, but when in Washington, if you say immigration reform, everybody hears that as amnesty, and that's not what I mean. I mean Trump-style immigration reform, which means a wall, which means strong enforcement, uh, which means getting rid of the dumbest immigration policies like the diversity lottery, chain migration, family reunification, and things like that, where we just take in uh, millions for the sake of taking in people without regard to who they are or what they contribute, or even whether or not they'll end up on public assistance. The public assistance rate for foreign-born is much higher than it is for native-born, and it's a problem. Um, and, then, and in fact, the Trump administration is addressing that now, uh, and are getting all kinds of uh, opposition. So Im immigration, uh, first and foremost, trade policy, keep up the pressure on countries that treat us unfairly, including China. Uh, the president's been solid on that. I mean, he's actually managed to do the seemingly impossible, which is be tough on China in the trade arena, and yet not create what everybody fears would be a new Cold War where uh, we're at a kind of standoff. He has a good relationship with the, China, with the Chinese president, with the Chinese leadership, we talk to one another. But since they haven't given him what he needs, he also hasn't used that relationship as an excuse to back down. So I think we need to keep up uh, with all of these things. Um, there are some other things that I will talk about later in the book on higher ed reform. I'm, sim I'm very sympathetic to the Bernie bros on the student loans, for instance. The solution that they would have, which is just you know total forgiveness kind of on the government, I'm not for. Um, I think that for the, for, uh, uh, to a very large degree, they got scammed by their colleges. Those colleges know that they're not producing a particularly great product that's going to go out and get you a job, at least not to the extent that it used to. It's not, going to, it's not going to translate to the income that you need to pay back the loan. And look at the endowments of colleges, the salaries of administrators, but also just the sheer size of staff as opposed to faculty at these universities. They've exploded over the last couple of decades in a way on the backs of these federally backed student loans. And they're laughing all the way to the bank and the students are left holding the bag to mix metaphors. So I, th I think we, you know, there are ways we can address that. Uh, anyway, I'll, I will... Um, I will lay all this out in the last chapter or two of the book. Not that I'm a great policy expert. I'm more of a compiler and synthesizer of things that I've seen out there that make sense that you know we, the country could pursue, that we don't pursue not because they're bad ideas, but because there's just, there's just so much self-interested opposition to a lot of these ideas. So I, I view it as, a, as, a, as a, a success or a contribution if I simply popularize these things and give them a more of a hearing so that they, the real experts who, who, who build these ideas and, and know them down to the, you know, the lines of code that would make it into legislation can get a hearing and start working on it. Well, Michael Anton, it's such a pleasure to have you again. <laughs> Thank you.